Hey, good morning, uh, TFOS community. I'm excited to uh, uh, be with you today virtually. Um, I want to welcome you to this uh, short course on uh, battery modeling techniques. Um, if you, my name is uh, William Walker. I, I work at the NASA Johnson Space Center. I, I specialize in battery thermal, uh, battery thermal analysis, uh, battery uh, thermal testing, things like that. Um, so, go share my screen real quick just to pull something up for you. Um, before we get started, so I just want to go over a few uh, uh, housekeeping things. Uh, one thing that you could do to help me out. Um, Actually, if you'll give me just one moment, it looks like my screen is not sharing properly. So I'm going to go on mute real quick. I'm going to ask Alex to, to help us out with that. Alex, I've got my screen shared, but it's not coming across on the screen. Hey, there we go. All right, so uh, let, let's try that again. So, so one thing that you could do uh, to uh, help me out just with future planning, I, I've been offering a short course at TFOS for the past few years now discussing uh, uh, battery thermal aspects. We've discussed everything from battery thermal, battery thermal modeling, testing, uh, charge and discharge modeling to thermal runaway modeling. And so I thought this year, you know, it'd be fun to change things up. And rather than giving that same short course, um, I wanted to do something that was a little more modeling centric. And, and so this year, uh, we're going to be focused on uh, modeling techniques as they pertain to the different software packages that are out there. And so you're going to hear from uh, NASA on some stuff we've done, you're going to hear from, uh, from GT Suite, you're going to hear from Siemens, you're going to hear from Thermal Desktop. Uh, but one thing you can do to help me out with planning future sessions is uh is to uh tell me one how did you hear about this session that you're at today and also number two uh to send me an email and i've got my email put on the screen here send me an email let me know how you heard about the session but also uh tell me about what other battery thermal topics you would maybe like to see covered at future tfos uh so i uh, just wanted to share that little bit with you um and now uh a few other housekeeping things just uh I know they said this in the chat, but they wanted us to uh, go over it with you verbally as well. That's, uh, you know, just take note throughout the day, their schedule breaks. And so use that for checking uh, your, your phone and your email. Um, you know, when you're in the session, please pay attention uh, as the uh, to, to the speakers. Um, if you've not registered for the conference, but you're attending, please do, so please go ahead and register. That really helps our team out with uh, planning for future years. Um, during during the presentation, uh, use the chat bar feature to ask your your question. So you can see that on the right hand side of your screen there. Um, what else do we have? Uh, if you don't see the chat window, uh, try a different browser. We haven't had success with uh, Firefox. Um, if you're having any audio issues or streaming issues, try using the uh, refresh button or the play pause button. Um, and then at the end of the session, I will be, or at the end of each speaker, I will be fielding questions. And so sometimes when you type questions into the chat bar, there can be a little bit of a delay. So if there's, a, if there's any pauses, just, just wait a minute. It may take a second for, uh, for your questions to come through. So Kylie, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you and Jonathan. And, and why don't, uh, why don't you, uh, start sharing your screen? Uh, but for our first presentation, you're going to have a presentation uh, given on behalf of NASA by Kylie Cooper and by Jonathan London. Uh, Kylie is a first year master's student in aerospace and mechanical engineering at the University of California, Davis. Uh, she has been an intern with NASA Johnson Space Center uh, working with me over the summer, uh, and she'll be continuing on over the fall where she's focused on uh, battery thermal topics as it pertains to uh, battery thermal management and battery safety. Uh, she also has uh, interest in uh, small satellites, uh, specifically in determination and control. Uh, and then she also is, has interest in satellites as it pertains to thermal modeling of space systems. Uh, then Jonathan London, who co-authored this presentation with her, is a senior at Ohio State University. He's working towards a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Uh, I believe he, he is going to end up pursuing his master's degree in mechanical engineering, focusing on thermofluids. Uh, he's worked at the NASA Glenn in support of Artemis and Orion programs, performing, th performing thermal analysis on the European Service Module Propulsion Systems. And then he, along with Kylie, was also uh, a student intern at the NASA Johnson Space Center, supporting, uh, supporting uh, some of the battery thermal work we're, we're doing down there. Um, 
some of his some of his work primarily focused on a calorimeter uh, that we've designed and various revisions to it, data reduction and thermal analysis. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, I think Kylie, who's going to kick things off from there. Okay. Um, thank you, Will. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay. Um, thank you in advance to all the other presenters in this uh, short course. And thank you to all of you who are attending this presentation. So batteries are pretty complex components, and there's a huge need in industry right now for people to understand how to do battery thermal modeling. Um, but it can often be overwhelming to start developing a thermal model of a thermal model of a battery, or even to know where to begin. So Jonathan and I have developed this short course to give you an overview of some practical thermal modeling techniques for batteries. Uh, to provide you some guidance and to answer some of those questions you might have, like, where do I begin? So this short course will not be software specific. Instead, it will describe best practices for general model development and analysis. And to give you a quick overview of what we'll be covering, oops, sorry, the slide didn't change. There we go. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview of what we'll be covering in today's short course, uh, Jonathan will start off by introducing the analysis-driven approach to battery design, its benefits, and what to expect from our model. He will then go into battery heat generation and our thermal model construction. I will then come in and cover our key model development guidelines, uh, our thermal analysis, including our demo results and what to look for in both charge-discharge profiles and thermal runaway events. And then we'll wrap it all up with a summary of our part of the course. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan, uh, and he's going to talk about the analysis-driven approach to battery design. Thanks, Kylie. Yeah, so I'm going to be starting off today with just talking about a little bit of background on analysis-driven approach for battery design. Uh, so an analysis-driven approach is often taken to develop effective lithium-ion battery thermal management systems and also to characterize the general performance of the overall battery assembly during design and certification phases. So there's various forms of thermal analyses that we use uh, as battery designers to help understand system level thermal profiles as a function of the battery assembly architecture in combination with the cell level heating. So this analysis can often be difficult due to the complex thermal paths and thermal networks that a battery assembly has, as well as the cell level heat generation mechanisms and the cell level geometry. So this presentation was developed to pro provide practical battery thermal modeling techniques uh, we're going to be using the 14 cell bank of the alternative Orion small cell battery design. Um, so a little bit more, I'll be presenting a background on back, uh, battery heat generation in the next slide. Um, after that, a step-by-step -step process will be presented for the construction of a thermal model using that 14 cell bank I mentioned before, um, using space claim, TD direct, and thermal desktop. Um, using this model, we had five model development guidelines that we developed for using um, if you want to build a practical and effective battery thermal model. And then finally, we have a few uh, results of a, a few analyses that we've ran through. Um, the focus being on what the results look like and how to look for them, and rather than the interpretation of the results and the exact numbers. And as again, as Kylie mentioned, the presentation is focused on the technique rather than how to do something specific in one software package for us. So for NASA, we built our model using thermal desktop, but again, these techniques are apl applicable in any software package. It's just kind of our method. Okay, so a little bit of background on battery heat generation now. Um, so there's two main ways that you can get battery heat generation. We have charge and discharge profiles and also thermal runaway events. So we'll talk about charge and discharge first. So battery design team should understand that heat is generated with lithium ion batteries operated. And this heat generation is due to certain reversible and irreversible processes that are associated with the electrochemical reactions that drive the battery charge and discharge. So Bernardi developed an energy balance that can be used to predict the temperature change of a lithium ion cell as a function of the following items, um, enthalpy of reactions and the associated entropic heating, um, the enthalpy of mixing, phase change due to fusion of ions, change in capacities, um, heat capacity, heat associated with electrical work and overpotential, and heat transfers to surroundings. So summing that up, um, lithium ion cell internal heat generation due to this charge and discharge, um, we can often represent that with a simplified segment of that equation that has all those factors, which is Q cell equals I times the working voltage minus the over, uh, open circuit voltage plus T times the VOC DT. And again, the signs will change depending on charge and discharge. So unfortunately, the necessary transient profile for the voltages used to solve this equation are not always available and the data is not easily ready available. So in this case, 
our cell can be treated as a resistor and the heat generation can be approximated based on Ohm's law, um, which is P equals I squared R, where R is our internal resistance of the cell and I is the operating current we're using. So now a little bit of background about thermal runaway, which is the other form of heat generation we were talking about. Um, so safety concerns exist for lithium ion battery utilization due to the possibility of thermal runaway events. So on the right here, you can see a, a picture that kind of depicts a thermal runaway event. You can see the top normal cell operation and then through B, C, and D, we have a pretty volatile reaction that happens here, which is a thermal runaway event, which is obviously not a good thing for our cell packs if we're trying to, to design a good cell pack. So just a little bit of background about thermal runaway now. Um, thermal runaway is really a function of cell achieving a high level of temperatures due to several different items of which include thermal failure, which would be like an over temp, um, a mechanical failure, which would be something like a nail penetration, um, internal and external short circuiting of which we have hard and soft variants, and electrochemical abuse, which would be like a hard, uh, charge and discharge overcharging. So once we reach these elevated temperatures, an exothermic decomposition decomp reaction begins. So this we have the self heating, which uh, begins when heat generation rates exceed the heat uh, dissipation capacity of the cell. So at this point, we have a self-sustaining reaction, which turns into a thermal runaway event. The rate of the exothermic reaction increased with the temperature in the Arrhenius form. So eventually, stability is lost, and the cell rupture and fire occurs, and all the remaining electrochemical energy is released. So that's kind of images B and C on the right there, which is uh, you can see is pretty volatile. So the models describing the decomposition rates of the self-heating rates are provided with the following charts. And the severity of the event can increase if combustion between the gases released from the cell and the surrounding atmosphere is not prevented. And this could lead to propagation, which is a chain reaction event that occurs when thermal runaway for energy from initial cell causes neighboring cells to also overheat and suffer their own failures. So this is obviously a, a large, a huge concern for our design techniques. And then finally, the heat loads we use in this, oh, sorry, go back to Kylie real quick. Uh, the heat loads determined from the calorific techniques are often used when simulating thermal runaway. So Kyle will get into that a little bit later in the stream. Okay, so now just a quick overview of our uh, model construction process. There were five steps we used. I mean, kind of see them here. I'll go over each one in detail in, the, in a minute, but just the high level. Um, so we have a reference model of the bank and components, which included um, defeaturing CAD, domain tag sets, and thermal props. And then our second step was creating a reference model of the 18650 cell, which we had a variant, um, the regular version and a trigger cell variant. Um, we created a cold model or a reference model of the cold plate, which is uh, convecting to room temperature. Um, and then we have a reference model of the cell placement geometries, which I'll get into detail about that in a minute. And then finally, we had a master model that combines all of the previous models using XREF and TD Direct. So now a little bit more detail for each of these steps. Um, for step one, this was creating a reference model of the battery bank. So this included um, defeaturing our CAD, um, assigning domain tag sets for all our interfacing surfaces, um, thermophysical and optical properties, as well as radiation analysis groups, and then finally meshing and importing the thermal desktop. So you can see on the left side of the slide here uh, for image A, examples of defeaturing um, some of these holes through some of the uh, small features on the tabbing there uh, don't provide a really significant heat path and also just complicate our model with more nodes. So those are the kind of things we remove when defeaturing our CAD. And then for B, C, and D in the middle here, this is an example of the interstitial foam. Um, we just assigned uh, domain tag sets for interfacing surfaces, such as the foam to the end cap of our reference bank, which you'll see later, and then thermophysical properties and optical properties. And repeated this process for all the components of the reference bank. So in step two, we created a reference model of the uh, 18650 cell. So we built a single cell and thermal desktop, which is using uh, native geometries, including a distinct jelly roll geometry, which you'll hear a lot about in this presentation. Kyle will go into detail about that, but that's an important point. And then we also assigned our domain tag sets for the interfacing surfaces as before, and also our thermal physical and optical properties. And if you look on the le uh, bottom left here, um, you can see the kind of a progression. So on the left, we have our trigger cell version, which is just a higher nodalization version of our reference cell, which is the middle version here. And then finally, on the right side, we have the 18650 jelly roll, which is a distinct geometry that's separate from our cell casings on the two left images. Okay, so now step three, um, we created a reference model of our cold plate. 
So essentially the code plate uh, was also cre created using native geometries and thermal desktop. Um, it's basically just a big square with one boundary node, which will convect uh, from that cold plate to room temperature. Um, again, we have our, our node set up at 25 degrees C and a boundary node. Um, then again, domain tag sets and thermophysical and optical properties and our radiation analysis groups on that. And then model four, um, a reference model for our cell placement. So just the way that therm uh, thermal desktop and XREF work together, we needed a way to place our cells in the correct position in the battery bank, which was coming in from space claim. So we kind of worked within the reference bank and eliminated some of the fe all the features that we didn't need, except for kind of those locating circles that we would use to place our cells, which in the in the final uh, in the final master file. Um, there really isn't anything too complex about this besides it just being there for location. And then finally, once we had all those individual models set up, we put a master file together in Thermal Desktop, and this was using TDirect and XREF, which allows us to load in multiple of the same file. Um, so we use TDirect to import the battery bank, um, which is the kind of that middle image here in the reference bank you saw before, and the cell placement geometry, which is a previous slide. And then we use XREF to place individual 18650 cells at each cell location on our placement geometry, and then again, XREF to import our cold plate. So just kind of left to right here on this slide on the bottom, you can see on the left we have our 14 cells um, placed on the cell placement geometry. We have 13 of the reference cells and then one trigger cell, which will move around, which again is just a higher nodalization version of the reference cell, the same geometry. And then in the middle, we have the reference bank, which you can see has a bus bar, the end cap, interstitial foam, and the other end cap on the bottom side um, with the cells placed inside. And then finally, on the right side, we have some examples of the radiation analysis groups. So this is just an external RADK group we used for radiation to room temperature. And that pretty much sums up our model construction. So I'll go ahead and throw it over to Kylie for dis uh, discussing the modeling techniques and development guidelines. OK, um, thank you, Jonathan. So now that Jonathan walked us through the demonstration model development, we are going to highlight some of the key things to keep in mind when developing your models. And of course, every model is going to be unique, uh, but these five key guidelines can help you to stay organized in both your model development and in your analysis. So starting off with this first guideline, um, organization is key. So things can get pretty complex very fast when you're developing these thermal models. You can easily go from a couple cells to a couple hundred cells, you know. Um, so if you don't have proper organization, you can easily get lost. This is, like we, this is why we like to emphasize using an organized and easily understood naming and numbering convention for both your banks and for yourselves. So for example, if you look over at the top right portion of this slide, uh, you can see that we kept a consistent numbering convention for all of our cells that we imported with XREF and Thermal Desktop. So this made it easy to switch between the trigger cell um, in the central position, so which we use number eight for, um, and the corner position, which we use number 14 for. It also helped us uh, later on in our analysis when we wanted to take a look at the temperature profiles of the neighbor cells uh, for the thermal runaway cases. And again, as your model grows in size and complexity, just knowing which bank or cell you're referring to is, uh, is quite necessary. So for our second guideline, we want to emphasize the importance of modeling distinct battery features. You'll hear us say this a lot throughout this presentation. Uh, this is a really important one. So often to simplify models, analysts will represent uh, a cell with a lump model. But if we do that, we can lose sight of what the temperature of the cell casing is versus the temperature of the jelly roll. Uh, we'll refer to the electrode winding as the jelly roll interchangeably in this presentation. Um, so the cell casing and jelly roll, they have different thermal properties, and therefore they're going to have different temperature, profi temperature profiles. Uh, the jelly roll typically gets hotter than the cell casing. And again, we'll show this in a few slides when we get to the analysis portion. Um, but being able to access them separately will allow you to analyze their temperature profile separately. This is advantageous because during physical testing, we can only probe the cell casing with thermal couples. Uh, which means that the highest temperature we can read isn't necessarily the highest temperature that the cell is actually experiencing. So again, just modeling these distinct is um, pretty important. 
So for our third guideline, we emphasize model flexibility. Uh, it is important for this model to be able to support frequent changes, to take advantage of uh, reused geometries. So for example, we use the XREF feature to support changing the trigger cell position um, between, again, the central position and the corner position. Uh, so just with the click of a button, we could change it instead of having to develop, develop a whole new model. Um, and again, using something like XREF, um, you know, there's other software, softwares have other um, features similar to this. Just use something, using something where if you make uh, one change in a part, it can update in the assembly, that's really convenient. So for our fourth guideline, we emphasize using grouping utilities. Uh, it's important to establish easily, easily accessible groups of surfaces and el elements for assigning both contactors and heat loads. So for example, here we use domain tag sets uh, in space clean and thermal desktop. But of course, there are similar features uh, and other modeling softwares. Uh, we use them to assign the groups for the contactors between the cell casing and the interstitial foam, which you can see uh, over on the right portion of these slides. Uh, we also use domain tag sets to have control over the cell jelly rolls uh, for the heat load application. So kind of building off that last point, uh, for our final guideline, we recommend having both bulk control and cell-specific control over the jelly rolls. This allows you to perform different types of analyses. So for example, uh, we use the bulk jelly roll heat loads when we're doing the charge and discharge analysis. We apply the same heat load uh, to all of the cells at once. Um, but you also want to be able to have that cell-specific control uh, for something like a thermal runaway case, right? Where you want to apply a heat load to a singer, single trigger cell. Um, yeah. So now we will move on to the analysis portion of this course. Here we will talk about some of our example results, as well as some tips on what to look for in your analyses. So first, for our demonstration model, we had the following boundary conditions. Our nodes were initialized to 25 degrees celsius we had a cold plate underneath our heat sink maintained at 25 degrees celsius uh, you saw that in jonathan's portion of this presentation we also had a radiative sink temperature of 25 degrees c so for our analysis cases we had two main groups that's the charge and discharge group uh, again that was with the bulk heat loads and then we had the thermal runaway cases that was with the cell specific heat loads so for charge and discharge, uh, we did three different profiles. That's the 0.1C, the 0.5C, and the 1C charge and discharge profiles. And for thermal runaway, we did both a central trigger case and a corner trigger case. Corner, corner trigger case, sorry about that. Um, so jumping right into our charge and discharge analysis, you can see all of our information for the analysis in the table below, including our C rates, our current, our estimated internal resistances and our heat loads. So for the purposes of this analysis, we did use Ohm's law or the P equals I squared R relationship to represent our charge and discharge profiles. Uh, do keep in mind that this relationship should be treated as an approximation for quick turnaround analysis. So if you'd like to perform a more extensive analysis, you can consider the effects of overpotential and entropic heating with the Bernardi relation. Uh, we provide that reference for you in the end of the presentation if you're interested. So make sure to check out these slides uh, after our presentation. And one more thing to keep in mind here is that you should know both your heat load per cell and your total bank heat load. Very easy to forget to calculate your total heat load. I know we did that a couple times in this analysis. <laughs> so just keep in mind that um, you, know, you should be calculating both, you should be keeping track of both, and you should know which one uh, you are applying during your model or during your analysis. So now that we have applied, once we've applied the bulk heat load as described in the modeling guidelines, one of the first things we want to look at is the bank gradients. Um, so this is important because we want to ensure that all the cells in a bank operate at a near uniform temperature. This is to prevent undesired degradation of the cells. So looking down here at these isothermal images, we can see that even though the 1C profile runs for a lot less time than the 0.1C charge profile, um, it causes a noticeably larger thermal gradient. So when designing a battery, the effect that different C rates have on your system is pretty important to keep in mind um, and to know ahead of time. One of the less obvious 
but equally important things to keep in mind is examining the difference between the jelly roll and the cell casing temperature profiles. Um, again, hitting this, you know, hitting this point again. So as mentioned in the guidelines section, modeling and having access to the jelly roll and casing is strongly recommended because doing that allows you to probe those features um, and examine their response to the heat load independently. So here we see that the jelly roll temperature is typically a couple degrees higher than that of the cell casing. Uh, this is important because when you're doing physical testing, you can't actually measure the hottest part of your cell. Uh, you can only probe the casing again. So just make sure when you're doing these charge and discharge profiles that you are looking at uh, both features of that cell, uh, of all your cells. So, now we're going to move on to the thermal runaway analysis cases and results and talk about how to post-process this information. So for the purposes of this analysis, we applied 50 kilojoules to the trigger cell jelly roll um, over a two second period. You can see our trigger cell labeled with uh, T right there in the diagram in the top right corner. Again, uh, this was the higher fidelity 18650 model that Jonathan mentioned earlier. Uh, so some things to keep in mind when you're post-processing your results. Uh, just like when we did the charge and discharge analysis, the movement of the heat throughout the battery pack as a whole is really important. So you can look at those through your isothermal images or through animations like you see down here in the bottom. Uh, and this is the center trigger, center trigger cell case that you see here. Um, we also have the animation for the edge trigger cell case, which you can see running now. Um, and something that's unique to thermal runaway is that you're going to be wanting to look at the neighboring cells. So for the central, central trigger cell case, uh, when you know, position eight was where the trigger cell was, you'd want to look at um, cell seven, three, four, nine, 13, uh, and 12, and see their response to the thermal runaway event. So for the edge trigger cell case, we are looking at only cells nine and 13. And because it has less neighbors, uh, the edge trigger cell case is actually the worst case scenario. Um, and we'll cover that in just a second. So again, make sure that you have access to uh, the information for all of these cells, as well as these cells, individual jelly rolls and casings. So as mentioned a little bit earlier, um, you should do both the edge and the central cases. And from a cell to cell propagation standpoint, uh, edge cell thermal runaway tends to be the worst case scenario, again, because it only has a couple neighboring cells. So in this example, we can see that the neighboring cells for the edge cell case get uh, around 10 degrees C hotter than those for the central trigger cell case. And, you know, this is really important because it can mean the difference between passing or failing an abuse test, depending on your pass or fail criteria. Um, and of course, test correlated analysis can be used to help battery designers understand the difference between the test data gathered uh, with temperature sensors or your thermocouples and the overall system level response. Something that I didn't mention on the last slide again, uh, why those red and black plots that you saw were so important, uh, is just to make sure that cell to cell propagation is not occurring. So that pretty much sums it up for our portion of the short, short course. Uh, just to kind of recap on what we've talked about today, Jonathan talked about the model construction. So he went over how we created our reference model of the battery bank, uh, our reference models of the 18650 uh, lithium ion cells and the trigger cell, our hold plate, our cell placement, and how we put that all together in thermal desktop using TD Direct and XREF. Uh, we then talked about practical and effective modeling guidelines, right? So how to kind of generalize these model construction and analysis techniques so that they're not software specific. Um, so again, the first one, organization is key, making sure that you're keeping track of uh, all of your cells, all of your banks, everything that's going on in your model. Model distinct battery features, you heard us talk about that a lot. Make sure that you have both the jelly roll and the cell casing in your model. Create a flexible model so you can reuse geometries and you can support frequent changes. Utilize grouping utilities so you can have easy access over any part of your model at any time. And differentiate between your bulk and cell-specific jelly rolls. Uh, then we went and talked about the charge and discharge analysis. So again, those profiles can be determined via your p equals i squared r relationship, or you can use the Bernardi method. 
again, check our references if you would like to use the Bernardi method. Um, and then, you know, talking about looking at the difference between the jelly roll and cell casing temperatures and the bank gradients, so you don't have undesired degradation of your cells. And for your thermal runaway analysis, um, again, looking at edge and trigger cell cases and making sure cell to cell propagation doesn't happen. And again, looking at those uh, temperature profiles of the neighboring uh, cells. So here's our references slide. Again, you can access our slides after this presentation. I just want to give a big thank you to uh, Dr. Walker. Thank you for <laughs> uh, helping Jonathan and I put this together. And I think we're going to open up the floor for questions now. Great. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and encourage everyone, if you do have questions, go ahead and start typing those into the chat bar. And then while that happens, I do have one or two questions that we can go ahead and start going through, Kylie. Uh, the first question is by Michael in Huntsville, Alabama, and he asked, uh, can, you give an, can you give us an idea of which parts of the model have a higher thermal conductivity? So maybe, Kylie, you could go to back to one of your pictures uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the bank and then kind of point out which parts are the higher conductivity parts and which are the lower conductivity parts. Right. I'll start going through the slides. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to help jump in and help me with this one too? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So here's our exploded view of our uh, model. Kylie, are you going to answer the question or is Jonathan? Oh, I think I, I'm going to turn this over to Jonathan. All right, okay. go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, so um, as far as the higher conductivity pieces, if, you, if we look through the, the gradient on the animations, which were later in the presentation, uh, the capture plate and the bus bar kind of respond pretty quickly. Um, and the, the foam liner is really the piece that we we saw that doesn't really have a high thermal conductivity. And then that, that's by design. but um, Really, the, the capture plates and the bus bars is what we found was more thermally conductive. Great. And then I think uh, th there was another question that you just answered uh, by default. Uh, uh, Alicia uh, uh, Liebscher asked us if for the thermal runaway analysis, did you use an air gap or the interstitial foam between the cells? If it's the second, what are the properties of the foam? So I think he just uh, clarified. So, so the syntactic foam liner was used for all of the cases. Is that correct, Jonathan? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And then, do you remember what the properties were? What the thermal conductivity of the foam was in your assumption? You know, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's not it's not very high. I I can't imagine. I I want to say somewhere in the range of two hundred max watts per meter kelvin. No, I don't think it was that high. Yeah, uh, I think I think uh, that's something uh, that we could probably handle, Alicia. I, I know I know you have my contact info. If you'll reach out to me, we can certainly get you a more detailed answer on that question. Uh, then we have a question from Brent. Uh, do you consider a gap forming between the case and the jelly roll during thermal runaway? So I, I think the answer to this question would, would be no. If I'm understanding the question, he's talking about the case as in, as in the cell casing versus the jelly roll. Um, and, and that's a that's a very good question. So when, a, 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 and I apologize, Jonathan and Kylie, I'm gonna, this is just something we didn't talk about. So I, I'll try to take a stab at it. So th this is a good question, right? When a cell explodes, all of those materials inside of the cell start reacting that there's a level of pressure buildup and expansion and then the material squeeze out. And so you can have a drastic effect on the theoretical thermal conductivity, right? Of course, when we do, when, when you do a, when you look at the literature out there on, on what your interface resistance is between the jelly roll and that cell casing, uh, it's for a cell that's just sitting there, right? It, it, you, that's, it's not necessarily possible to make that measurement. And so the, the short answer is no, uh, we did not take into consideration the gap forming between the case and the jelly roll, although that would make for an interesting study. And then I, I want to I have uh, one last one here for you guys, and then we're going to move on to the next presentation. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to throw this at Kylie. Kylie, JC asked us, uh, do you have suggestions for creating a simplified battery model uh, to incorporate into a spacecraft model? Right. Um, so kind of like we covered, I'm going to see if I can find that. Kind of like we covered here, um, simplifying the models our first step when we created this. Um, so what you want to look for is anything that doesn't have a significant impact on your thermal model. So we had these like pretty small holes in our model that were necessary for structural reasons, but they're not going to have a huge effect thermally on our model. Uh, so you can see kind of like these tabs on the bus bars or these small holes. And we had those, uh, if you have like small, small edges, small corners, uh, you can definitely take those out and just simplify your model um, so that it's easier for meshing and so that it uh, runs faster as well. Um, and then uh, there was one quick question that came in from Ron uh, to follow on. How do you model the, the the heat transfer between the case and the jelly roll? So in y'all's case, how did how how did you model that interface, and what uh, what heat transfer value did you use? Right. I think I can take this too. Um, so we that was a good question. We had that question too. Um, so you can look at our references slide. Um, you can see here, we found the interface resistance value um, from one of our references. So again, just assigning that as a conduction coefficient in thermal desktop. So if you go ahead and look at that reference, that should help you out a lot. So Gaitande et al, uh, that, that, that's out of Amy Marconet's group at, at Purdue University, and, and they developed a, a test apparatus that allowed them to directly measure the um, the interface resistance between the cell casing and the jelly roll. Um, and they purport, they provided a number of high and low values and an average value, which are very, very effective for thermal modeling. Okay, uh, so with that said, uh, Kylie, Jonathan, I wanna thank you uh, for your presentation. This has been very informative uh, and uh, these charts will be made available uh, through the TFOS proceedings. The recording will be available through the TFOS proceedings. Um, and then this presentation specifically will be available through NASA NTRS. Uh, and of course, you're welcome to reach out to, to either of us uh, if you have questions uh, for this presentation. Uh, but with that said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask Koshik to go ahead and get his presentation pulled up on the screen. Um, and while he does that, I will provide an introduction to him. So our second presentation is going to be from uh, Koshik Gala uh, from uh, Siemens PLM. He is an application specialist for ePower Terrain at Siemens PLM. He has his double E bachelor's from uh, JNTU in India and his double E master's from Sunny in Buffalo. Uh, he previously worked in various consumer and global manufacturing companies since 2011. Uh, that includes Sun Power, Regal, Bulloy, QM Power, uh, and before and he worked for them before joining Siemens PLM in 2016. Uh, he has a background as a product and software uh, development professional with expertise in electrical machines and batteries. He is a technical lead for all e-power train uh, related technology. Uh, he is responsible for defining future strategy and anticipating market simulation needs and disseminating the best uh, usage of Sun Center uh, solution portfolio for e-power terrain. Uh, so with that, I want to welcome Kaushik and thank him for uh, his presentation. And I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thanks, Will. Um, hopefully you can see the screen as well. Um, so I'll start off. I'm going to talk about how you would want to design an abuse tolerant battery pack. <clears throat> okay, the key takeaways that I'd like to consider is how we can approach that from a recycle point of view, where we consider cycling, aging, thermal runaway studies, and the same strategies can be applied there. Uh, what are the right tools to achieve something like that? And then I'll showcase with a case study on how uh, the workflow and how it can all be tied up together. Once I have like the system level requirements, I would like to then dwell into and what that would translate to individual components. So what should be the cell design? How should be the pack design with its ancillary devices and 
how would that fit into the whole system level perspective if there is other electromechanical parts which are flowing through and how the battery pack would behave in that system environment. And then I can combine it with my hardware and loop or software and loop to verify if it's working as expected. If not, then I can do like a design exploration or improve on the very design um, by using optimization methods to incorporate that. So I'll go through each of those processes in one um, slide after other. So usually having like the test would give you the right results, but those are expensive. Um, so doing a pack level validation. If you're doing a simulation, um, it's dependent on the geometry based modeling and computationally it can be expensive. Um, if you're doing just a 1D model, you can accommodate all the complex systems, but may require inputs on several uh, input parameters which are needed for the 1D modeling. And just combining these three together, you kind of achieve a, a fairly good solution where you negate all the negatives that I spoke about. Um, so the need for doing that holistic digital twin is once you create a digital twin of the product, you could look at, say, just the half cell electrode where you would want to consider the effects of tortuosity on the voltage potential drop um, based on what are the binders or conductive agents in the electrode. At the cell level, how would it behave for weighting procedures? Um, then at the pack level, for waiting drive cycles, how it would behave. Once I'm satisfied with my digital twin of the product, then I can know if I create a, a manufacturing line, what would that result um, in terms of timing? Is there any uh, inefficiencies that I can remove through the digital twin production? And once my product is in the field, how can I improve the uh, design based on the data that I receive? which would capture, which would be captured from the distal twin of the performance. And by doing that, you get that holistic distal twin product. So the challenges are multifold, right? You want to consider electrochemistry aspect of it. The SEM image can be then used for doing a more detailed electrode design. Once I do my detailed electrode design, I can do my detailed cell design. And from the pack level, if it's like a stack based cell, then there is cell breathing, which causes expansion and contraction. And how can I control that stresses, which are being created by including mechanical foams or some way to constrict that expansion. And obviously you want to consider the thermal um, variations as well within the cell, as well as across the cell based on the cooling part that you have. And the effect of uh, environment of that pack. It could be radiation, conduction, or conduction. Yeah. Or water based cooling or air based cooling. So, for the initial design, you could start off with some center AIMSIM, where um, say I don't have much details on the electrochemistry of the cell. I could use the data sheet to pull out the information that is needed, which are like the voltage uh, equilibrium curves, as well as the discharge curves. And using that, I could pre-calibrate a battery pack, but that would be limited in terms of on the temperature or the data sheet information that you have. But what you get is the validated battery requirements for um, the next more detailed model. So for doing the detailed model, you could uh, use some center battery design studio where you can do like a 3D physics based uh, solution where you could look at waiting duty cycles, how it would behave for aging or thermal abuse or cell breathing. Um, thermal abuse would include the chemical reactions occurring say because of the solvent and um, the electrode or the SEI decomposition, which happens first, and what would be the heat generation. Within BDS, uh, you could use the material properties and perform cost analysis and manufacturing tolerances of how you actually build a cell. 
you could also use your test results to uh, create a mock-up of the actual physical model if that was not available. Yeah. So once I have my detailed cell design, I could then expand it to do a part level design or do at a system level design with aims and assembling. So within the pack, you could consider a lump loss for a heat, which is not normally the case because the taps would have a different temperature across the current collector. The temperature would vary because the heat distribution would vary because the resistance is different. And uh, that is what it's accounted for when you do a detail level modeling with source heat loss, where it combines the thermal aspect as well as, as, well as the electrochemical aspect uh, together in one single easy workflow. And once I have my detailed model, I could create a reduced order model from that to then couple it with AIMSIM, and which can be done through an FMI, FMU based uh, setup. So I have my pack design now. I, how can I collaborate that with my attributes or of other aspects of the system? So I could use that not uh, modular tablet data to create like a map of how it would behave for varying um, duty cycles or at various load points. And that could be used to create those um, detailed components which were missing in the first um, system level design. What you get, for example, say if I had a coolant part with where I'm assuming a constant temperature and a constant pressure um, when I'm doing my detailed design, which is not the case because all the coolant path is flowing through different uh, aspects of the system. And having this combined 3D, 1D approach would give me a more realistic um, scenario. Yeah. And finally, I wanna consider my design exploration or how it, I can optimize my battery pack. So, here, what we were trying to do is reduce that magnet weight and increase the temperature uniformity. If you saw the first baseline design where the temperature is no longer uniform, whereas an improved design, you see the temperature is uniform and that affects the longevity of that battery pack, as well as um, increasing the performance as it ages. So we could reduce that magnet weight by 35% and we could reduce the um, temperature gradient by 30%, where we essentially modified the coolant path flow rates and we modified how would be the size of the battery pack. And this can be done combination of all the tools that I spoke about. Um, now I'd like to jump into thermal runaway modeling approaches where you, um, in the previous session, we heard how um, you can characterize it based on the actual physical test. There are multiple ways to do that. So you could do an ARC or a, a DSC based analysis where you get like the reaction rate versus um, time. And that would give you like a Gaussian based uh, distribution of it, which is, a great starting point to know how the propagation would happen. But the heat removal uh, within the cell will um, be limited in terms of, because the gas which has been evolved from the cell itself can um, cause uh, some heat to be removed and you are probably overestimating the temperature. So that's the next more detailed level if you knew um, with my FDR based analysis, if I could uh, know how much gas has been evolved, what are the gases being evolved, and what is the heat being dissipated out. Then I could include like chemical reactions of the gases. So depending on how much oxygen and carbon monoxide or other hydrocarbons are being eliminated, what are the reaction rates and what would be the molar concentration. That is the next um, level we would want to consider. And then finally, the chemical trans uh, reactions between multi-phase uh, species transport. So that would be like solid ejector being considered. Um, how would that happen? In, um, and finally, if 
say I have a flame underneath my cell, how can I um, actually simulate a test result and how that flame temperature would be affected, uh, affecting the battery pack's thermal propagation. So the CPU time efficiency and accuracy determines the appropriate method that you would want to select. And oversimplification with ARC or chemical reaction method, um, which is a slow forming process, may not fully capture everything if you don't account for um, all the gases which are eliminated or, yeah. So I'll go in a little detail about each of them. Um, in thermal runaway propagation, this is from an aircraft battery pass application where you had this first cell, which is in a thermal runaway. This shows how the online resources can be used for a prismatic cell. And these cells are connected in CDs. And this is the reference for the paper, which um, we tried to simulate. Um, so you could see that one cell, which is in thermal runaway, can propagate um, the other cells, which are connected in CDs, and how um, you can see the effect of that in the very environment. This is based on the ARC thermal analysis where you input that Gaussian uh, curve for uh, the reaction rate versus time. So I spoke a little about the battery thermal at the cell level, and this is what uh, BDS facilitates where uh, for each of the components within the cell, so positive, negative, um, electrolyte, separator, so when each of them are triggered at different times. Um, so for the positive part, I would know um, what would be its reaction, say, with the solvent or the binder, and what would be the rate of constant, and what is the reaction of heat. Um, is my voice audible or? Okay. Um, all right. So, um, with that, I could uh, essentially capture um, an ARC-based, open-based test uh, analysis as well. Um, here's an, a reference to a paper where um, they have utilized the same ARC-based model um, to know what would cause the thermal runaway and uh, how I can uh, use the battery ambient temperatures to either trigger or not trigger. And as you can see on the graph here, you can see if I had a higher uh, ambient temperature, uh, the th uh, cell undergoes thermal runaway. Whereas oops, undergoes thermal runaway, whereas here you can see that for lower ambient temperatures, there would not be any thermal runaway. So this is experiment versus uh, simulation as well. So you're able to account for all the reactant concentrations and rates and heats of formation of mass transfer. Um, so this is the ARC-based uh, test, so I can import a curve, something like this. And that first cell, which is in thermal runaway, results in thermal runaway across that whole pack based on how the cell heating rate of one cell can affect if I had included, say, how the foam layer or some way to control or mitigate that, then uh, that can be controlled um, based on the cell heat generation that we could see. Yeah. Um, here is an example of heat removal with the gas evolution, where here we show through um, a convection uh, it's a natural convection where first cell, which is in thermal runaway, can trigger other cells um, into thermal runaway, but we assumed the gas oxygen would remove 20% of heat, and that would be a more realistic one in comparison with what we had in the previous slide, where the cell um, would not consider that. The cell emissivity and uh, the delta temperature uh, were also important in terms of concentration, which we'll see in a case study. Yeah. So what we can account for is the pressure distribution and gas com uh, combustion, which would be a representation of the test that I do. Um, so for gas combustion analysis, right, there are various gases which come out 
from the composition. What you see here is I can capture what are the mass fractions, the flame temperature. So one of the cells which is in thermal runaway and how that affects the performance for the entire pack and how it would behave in the environment that it is in. So here again, I can capture what are the reaction rates and what would be the components and how, um, say, for example, carbon dioxide would be increasing and decreasing over the thermal runaway process where one cell, when it's dying out, the other cell is in thermal runaway and how that adds to the fuel. Um, here's a workflow of how uh, the temperature, I can set up a flame temperature, which is set at um, 1100 Kelvin, and um, I want to trigger it at one second. And what I can then specify is what are the species mass fraction and what is the static temperature of the inlet. And then I can specify where um, I want to trigger my um, thermal runaway from and I can set up my initial battery temperature. And once I do that, I could then um, see how much gas temperature uh, affects. So I could turn it on at point one and how that would result in a higher temperature evolution based on the flame that I have. Yeah. So here's a case study of a nine cell connected in a series and parallel. Um, so that cell is in thermal runaway where we looked at how the ambient temperature of uh, or the trigger at 300 degrees with cell emissivity of 0.4 um, 44 would consider the thermal runaway for a natural convection based example where I could see the peak at 800 and here at uh, 400 degrees Celsius. But if I use like a forced convection, I could see the peak temperature is no longer going to be at um, 800, but it's around like 700-ish. And I could uh, reduce that with a little further out. Um, probably it will become more clearer in the next slide that I show the summary of all of them. So here's um, for a forced air convection. So I'll jump to that final slide, um, where here we consider how much is the heat being dissipated with a natural convection versus what is the different emissivities with the force convection. You could always use radiation only based on the space application that you're um, trying to run it for. Um, here was an example with an air, um, where you could see I could delay that propagation if I use like air convection the same 0.2 uh, megajoules of uh, energy that is being generated. And with the natural convection with 0.99, uh, I could then see where the thermal trigger would happen based on um, my initial circuit design and the higher temperatures that it reaches. Um, here's a case study for uh, air-cooled battery pack where you can look at the initial design where I wanted to get a 183 kilometers of range, but because of my undetailed model, I caught around 167 of um, range. How can I improve on that? I could then use the system level design from designing a 183 kilometers of range to what should be my pack size. It needs to be 19 to 19.2 kilowatt hours for the sports vehicle, which is in T-shaped uh, battery pack. And then that would trigger that down to 200 amp hours of cell uh, capacity. Um, I want to apply a WLTC drive cycle for that. And what would be my SOC variation across that? Um, then I could do like a cell level design and get that uh, discharge verbs for various C rates. I could see how the pack's behavior would be for that air cooling, as well as the heat rejection for that. And the temperature rise was around six degrees for that. Um, 
then I could account for what is the stress distribution with and without foam. So the with foam, I could see two kilopascals of higher stress, but with um, with that, with foam, I could reduce that stress to almost 800 kilopascals, and that was um, pretty significant because I could reduce that um, cell breathing aspect of it. Finally, um, we want to create a more realistic solution by combining 1D and 3D, where I can account for the coolant path flow rates, and I could finally achieve my range from my pre-sizing versus my um, bi-directional coupled flow where I could get my range of 205 kilometers in comparison with what I had as 183 kilometers as one of the KPIs for me. Um, this one just summarizes what we tried to do with the air, and cool, uh, air coolant based thermal system where we accounted for electrochemical stress and aging and um, how you want to account for varying SOC uh, variation. What we could also do is simulate aging behavior where we could use half of your cell data, um, use machine learning to predict the model which accounts for varying um, depth of discharges, C rates, temperatures, and then fit that on the other half. And that's what we tried to do for this model. And what we noticed, the temperature um, rose almost uh, 15 degrees higher in comparison, and the original capacity fell to 76% at the eight cell verification. Um, yeah, in summary, what we showed is you could use test experimental data to characterize the electrical parameters, the 3D model for your thermal um, parameters, and that can be combined with the Monty model to do electrochemical thermal performance. And by doing that, you get that complete holistic picture of your digital trend. That's it for me. Um, I'm a little over two minutes, but um, let me know if you have any questions for me. Hey, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw your first question at you and, and encourage anyone else okay. with, with questions for your presentation to go ahead and please start typing those into the chat bar and I, I will start trying to uh, uh, throw those out to Kaushik. Uh, but the first question is, can the batteries modeled in SimCenter BDS be integrated into other SimCenter package models such as Space Systems Thermal model, for example? Um, I haven't um seen that request previously um but that is something which we can explore we don't have it as present yeah. all right uh, that's the only question that's come in uh thus far so I, i'm going to let um let the people type these in because sometimes there can be about a one minute delay but while we wait i have a question in your thermal runaway simulations uh you, you were talking about taking into account heat of reaction and, and all of that. Yeah. Is is yeah. is your software package um, geared up to 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 readily take into account the 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 kinetic relationships of, of thermal runaway heat release? So the you know the the relationship between uh, the decomposition reaction being an erroneous form reaction and the actual yeah. heat that is released. Are are you geared to take that level of fidelity into your analysis? Um, so currently what we've explored is just at the gas uh, compositions and the reactions. Um, we might have to consider, um, so when we do the SCI based decomposition and which is um, not only like gaseous components, but there is solid components and the multi-phase, that is something which we are exploring, but um, we are, so we have like a, three releases over a year and hopefully if there's some gaps that we find out we should be able to address it um so this is mostly like in research phase as of now that we are trying to explore because understanding that high fidelity or what are the reactions that we need to do um it's not that clear in terms of literature even if we use that um i think we should be um, 
fairly predictive of how it would behave. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'll ask uh, one more question. Uh, yeah. So it looks like in, in building a battery model in, in these packages, there, there's a lot of options available. Um, does the Siemens platform, uh, or I should say platforms, plural, offer recommendations, you know, to users who are trying to build maybe their first thermal model in your package? Uh, you know, will it, will it provide, does it provide explanations of what the options are and possibly recommendations on what users might use? Yeah, um, so we have a good documentation there, and there is a whole, um, articles in our platform called Steve Portal with where it guides you through examples and videos. But um, what is the nice part is once I've defined say a battery continuer, it would select all the continuer or the physics which are required for solving um, any kind of analysis in respect to batteries. And um, that is quite neat uh, in terms of how we implemented that. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for your presentation. This has been informative. Um, uh, like I uh, said in the, the chat bar, if you think of questions that we didn't get to during this session, stick on the line afterwards. I think we'll have a few, minute, few minutes afterwards and we can try to field any of those last minute questions. And I'll also be providing my contact information where you can send me an email with some of the questions and, uh, and I'll get those dispersed out accordingly. But with that said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask John Harrison to bring his presentation up and, and get ready. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce John now. Uh, so John's going to be giving the TT uh, presentation. Uh, John is an engineer at Gamma Technologies LLC, the makers of GT Suite multi-physics system simulation software. John has a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and has worked in the areas of multi-physics simulation for over 14 years. In recent years, John has supported customers in the areas of electrified aircraft to solve complex problems related to battery thermal management, state of charge, and state of health. So John, I want to thank you uh, for, uh, for uh, sharing, sharing with us today, and uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Excellent. Thanks, William, uh, for the introduction there. And so we're going to spend the next few minutes to talking about uh, the modeling approach to lithium ion battery modeling uh, using GT Suite simulation software and just show a brief agenda of the talk here uh, where will be an introduction to modeling battery thermal runaway. And then we're going to dive right into looking at uh, the same uh, battery pack that uh, Kylie and Jonathan had shared a few minutes ago and showing how that workflow would be done inside GT Suite's simulation software. And then we'll talk a little bit about the assumptions and some of the inputs that go into that. And then we'll show a few of the cases um, with different modeling scenarios, whether it be a, a charge or a discharge event and then thermal runaway as well. And then at the end, we'll highlight a few additional uh, distinguishing features inside GT Suite that we think uh, makes it a, a distinguishing feature uh, compared to other tools on the market. Um, and so with that, uh, in terms of talking about motivations for simulation of battery and safety, um, engineers often face a lot of challenges when designing systems that have batteries, including, for example, you know, just simple battery selection concepts. Uh, for example, how many cells are needed you know, do you need, you know, so many in series and parallel? What type of pack uh, or cell geometry would you go with, either pouch or cylindrical or others, um, to general battery performance? So, for example, you know, how long of a flight or a duty cycle can a pack last? Or, you know, is uh, active thermal management strategy, is that something that's going to be required for a particular design? And also, you know, how long will the batteries last? So, you know, engineers don't really know how long the batteries will last when they're designing a new prototype uh, without actually doing some physical testing. And also for battery safety, you know, simple things to how hot does the pack get or individual cells get? Is thermal runaway going to be a concern? Do you need a vented or an unvented pack? Um, these are a lot of the, the central questions that, that engineers are faced with. And we feel that multi-physics simulation can really help address 
these challenges to really eliminate, or not eliminate, but reduce a lot of the physical testing that's happening. And so the presentation going forward here is going to focus on uh, thermal runaway specifically uh, simulation of the NASA, NASA Orion module battery pack. Now, just a, uh, a brief introduction to the GT Suite software platform. Uh, GT Suite can be used, it's a multi-physics simulation platform, and so it can study the physics of different domains, starting with the electrical domain, where users can easily construct electrical circuits and powertrain components, and that includes motors and electrical equivalent batteries and so forth. And the user can also uh, model uh, electrochemistry inside lithium ion batteries, uh, either from a 1D uh, perspective or even a full 3D uh, cell perspective with electrochemistry. And the advantage to this is that you can have predictive aging analysis, um, and it's also backed by a comprehensive validated materials library. Uh, there's also the ability to do uh, thermal analysis inside the GT Suite software that allows users to do simple lump parameter thermal networks or full finite element assemblies of a thermal structure. And there's also a fluid flow library inside GT Suite uh, that's uh, primarily a 1D flow uh, library that allows users to model any gas, liquid, or two-phase fluid or mixture. Um, and there's also mechanical systems that can be done to study uh, multi-body dynamics in 1D to full 3D. And then there's also flexible and rigid bodies uh, using FE analysis. And the beauty of the multi-physics tool is that you can integrate all these different physical domains together to build whatever representative physical system you're trying to do. Uh, in this case, it's going to be for uh, the battery pack, uh, primarily on the thermal side today. And so now if we, if we dive right into uh, the pack that's being analyzed, uh, we've been taking uh, the design that's been put forth in uh, previous uh, references by William Walker here, uh, where you can see there's a pack of 14 18650 cylindrical cells uh, together, and you can see the construction of the pack. And um, due to uh, export control, the, the exact geometry of the pack is not known to us. However, we were able to build a representative geometry. We think that closely approximates this pack. And here you can see a lot of the dimensions that we're assuming here. Again, it's an 18650 cell uh, design, uh, and you can see the types of uh, materials uh, that are used inside the pack as well. And we'll talk about that in a moment. If we look at the, the cell uh, in particular, uh, the, there's some general specs that can be found for the Panasonic uh, NCR 18650B cell, um, including uh, just a general spec sheet um, that was readily available, which is very nice. Uh, it gives you things like rated capacity, nominal voltage, weight, uh, charge and discharge behavior, and even cycle life. Uh, so there's a lot of good information readily available online for this. Uh, and one of the key things that uh, Kylie and Jonathan had pointed out previously is uh, the user needs to know the internal resistance to calculate the heat dissipation rate from the cells in a uh, thermal runaway uh, event or just a standard uh, pack thermal modeling. Uh, and so in this case, uh, we obtained, uh, again, using a, a reference found online um, that looked at internal resistance of the cell at different temperatures and states of charge. And so we took this and we populated this into the uh, battery cell uh, module, which is an electrical equivalent battery. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well. And then also uh, information that needs to be known to calculate the heat dissipation rate is the open circuit voltage uh, as a function of state of charge. And there's another reference uh, that we found um, that uh, you can see the cell, uh, cell that we're looking at here is the energy cell here in blue. And so by taking all this information, we can uh, calculate a, a performance characteristic for the, uh, the battery using uh, an electrical equivalent approach. Now, a little bit about the, uh, the pack material properties that we're assuming. So uh, I know some, user, some, some of the audience asked a few of these questions in the uh, original presentation. Uh, and this is uh, table here just shows what our assumptions were and where the sources we got uh, for this information. So starting with the, the lower aluminum capture plate here, 
we're assuming it's um, just a, a, an aluminum, uh, basic aluminum material. Here you can see the properties for conductivity, specific heat, and uh, the source. So we're just using our standard GT suite uh, installation values for, for aluminum there. Uh, the syntactic foam liner, this is not something that's in our database, so we did a little research online to find uh, information about the, the liner. And you can see the conductivity, as was mentioned before, is very low. Uh, it's the lowest, obviously, of all the different materials of the pack, and of course, that's by design. Um, and then for the, uh, the Panasonic cells here, the, uh, the stainless steel sleeve here that we're assuming, um, again, we've got basic properties for stainless steel in our, in our library uh, that, that we're using here as a function of temperature. Now, the, uh, the jelly roll uh, the cell, uh, obviously, there's a collection of complex materials inside the jelly roll itself, but the specific heat we've seen to be, you know, around 1,000 joules per kilogram Kelvin. So that's where you we're using there. Um, and then for the upper capture plate, notice that it's a, a fiberglass uh, composition. And so the conductivity is actually anisotropic. And so the in-plane um, conductivity is much higher than the through-plane conductivity. And so we've incorporated the anisotropic behavior inside this uh, capture plate here, uh, highlighted in green. And then the, uh, the top bus bar, uh, I believe it is uh, made of a nickel property. Um, and so we're just using uh, basic properties of nickel for that. And then there's some basic assumptions that we're using for the contact resistance between all contacts inside the pack. And uh, it's assumed that uh, just uh, as a reference, because we don't really know uh, the detailed information about the pack, we just assume that it's one over a thousand, um, the resistance of that with the exception of the resistance between the jelly roll and the casing, uh, we use that same reference that uh, Kylie had pointed out earlier. Uh, it's anywhere between 1 over 800 to 1 over 400 uh, in terms of those values. Okay, so now if we get into the basic modeling workflow that we used inside the software, uh, there's a few basic uh, UI tools that are used uh, inside the software. So if because we didn't have the geometry of the pack to start with, we built this uh, very simply uh, with a GT Space Claim. So every license of GT Suite includes Space Claim, which is a, a model builder package uh, by uh, ANSYS. And so this took uh, a couple hours to set it up, um, and obviously it's de-featured. It doesn't have a lot of those, uh, you know, detailed uh, geometry characteristics. But as uh, was alluded to earlier, the, um, the, you don't really want all that detail because it can slow down your model for no real reason. Uh, so once the, uh, the CAD model is made, uh, then we uh, import that into the native 3D preprocessor inside GT Suite called GEM3D. This allows you to convert any native CAD uh, into either a thermal component, a mechanical component, uh, a battery, or uh, a flow component. In this case, we're using uh, a lot of the, uh, the thermal finite element uh, meshing capabilities. And once we had the CAD model made, it took about, you know, an hour or two to set up inside the 3D preprocessor. And then once that's done, then you can export this uh, 3D model into our uh, primary model building interface called GTEs. And this is where you can uh, define uh, parameters that allow you to explore the design space. You can define boundary conditions, initial conditions, and so on. This is also the interface where you ultimately run the model from and allows you to easily do optimization and DOE. Now, that probably took another couple hours to set up the model and to add the controls and so forth. So overall, the, the setup time took about a day or so, uh, conservatively speaking. And then uh, once the model is running and everything and you've you got some data that you want to analyze, then uh, you can use the post processor, the native post processor inside GT Suite to, to analyze the data. And so with the model set up, um, depending on the, the coarseness of the model, obviously the model uh, depends on the number of nodes and elements you have in your mesh. Uh, in this case, you know, it, took, it was about two times to four times faster than uh, uh, the simulation time. So if you looked at a 30 minute transient simulation, it would take anywhere from seven to 15 minutes of clock time to, to run. And there's the capability to do parallel processing. In this case, we just analyzed it on, on two cores, uh, quoting these values here 
and you can see there's uh, you know over 10,000 elements in the model. Now, uh, just a little bit more detail about the model setup. Uh, and the way it works is, again, it's a multi-physics uh, approach to the problem. And so the 14 cells in the pack are first uh, set up with a, an electrical model, where each cell uh, utilizes the information of internal resistance and open circuit voltage and um, state of charge and so forth to calculate a heat dissipation rate um, in uh, an overall electrical uh, circuit. And so this can also include other resistances that might come from uh, the bus or other components. Uh, and so the, the heat generated in each of these cells is then passed to the uh, thermal uh, representation of the structure here as well. And you can see each of the cells uh, and the jelly roll and casing and so forth are modeled here. Uh, and then the pack outer walls can radiate, radiate uh, to an ambient environment of, of 20C. And then this lower capture plate can conduct out to a 25C cold plate. And these are the assumptions that we're using. And so finally, uh, there's also controls components that you can uh, use to manipulate and command certain inputs to the model live. Um, and so that you can see the controls components overlaid on top of the electrical and thermal components in the model. Now, when it comes to, um, uh, let's see here. Okay, yeah, so if we look at the first case here, where we have um, the 1C discharge assumption, so you can see all cells uh, are starting off with a, a state of charge of one, and then over the course of an hour or so, it drains down and depletes completely. And you can see the current is pretty well balanced over all the different cells. Though you could imagine if you had uh, different states of initial states of charge or resistance variation within the cells, you could have more variation than this. And you can even do statistical analysis of that. Um, but you can also see here the cell temperatures. Again, there's not a whole lot of spread, probably less than uh, a half a degree C between all the different cells. And here you can see just a basic transient animation of the, the warm-up uh, as the cells are discharging over the hour. And this is the, the temperature uh, gradients at the end of that hour run. Now, if you look at the, the case two, which is um, uh, just the reverse of this, which is a 1C charge, you know, we're charging it basically at 1C over one hour, uh, starting with the initially fully depleted and then charging up. And you can see the, the currents are still pretty well balanced between the different cells. And again, there's about probably less than half a degree C spread between the cells. So this looks very similar to the 1C uh, discharge uh, as well. So now if we go and extend this to uh, look at the thermal runaway, there were some basic uh, principles that we had to use in the modeling approach. And so ultimately we wanted to compare to some tests that were run by NASA a few years back. And here you can see the experimental setup uh, where uh, one of the trigger cells here is being triggered into thermal runaway, and it's looking at thermal couple locations of neighboring cells. And then there's also one with a middle cell uh, that's going into thermal runaway as well. And so with the controls inside the model, the user can basically say, okay, well, which cell do you wanna trigger to thermal runaway? And uh, the, the runaway is triggered if uh, the jelly roll surface uh, temperature ever goes above 180C. And then if that's the case, then what we do is we apply some fraction of a total heat release. And that total heat release um, in kilojoules here, you can see this graph, again, is uh, also based on William Walker's uh, uh, research in the past. And I think we assume somewhere between 60 and 70 kilojoules uh, for this particular pack here. So we're saying roughly between 20 and 40%, I believe we used in the model uh, of the total heat release gets applied to that jelly roll surface if that temperature ever goes above 180C. And then, uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that. And then the final thing to mention here is that the, once the cell goes into thermal runaway, it's no longer part of the uh, electrical circuit. We just assume an infinite resistance on the circuit. Okay, so if we look at the, this first, the, the third case here, which is looking at this corner cell going into thermal runaway, here you can see some of the uh, test results that, that came from that, where the, uh, the trigger cell here 
in red is highlighted with the, the temperature here in orange. And you can see for the first couple hundred seconds, it's being heated. And then to the point of about 180C or so, it pops uh, and, and basically uncorks. And you can see the temperature spikes dramatically. And then it, also, it slowly starts to cool down. And then you can also see there's some other components here looking at temperatures, for example, the temperature of the uh, negative um, or the lower capture plate. And you can also see the maximum neighboring cell temperatures here as well. And so these are the, the test results. And then here you can see the, the GT suite model representation results. Here you can see there's basic heating uh, of the, the cell. And then once that control's kicked in at around 180C, the temperature pops, uh, that, that cell goes into thermal runaway. And then you can see the lower capture plate temperature getting to, yeah, it's a little over 150C in this case. Here it's a, a little bit lower in test, but the trend is very similar. And the maximum neighboring cell temps are around 100 in the test. In GT, they're about 100 as well. So there's pretty good agreement overall. And it's also worth noting that there was no propagation to other cells in this scenario. And so you, what's also interesting is because we're modeling the electrical uh, circuits uh, as part of this, you can see that um, because the first cell is being heated, it's carrying a slightly different current than most of the other cells in the pack. And then once it triggers to thermal runaway, then the other cells now have to carry the load that was originally carried by the trigger cell. And so that bumps the current of all the other cells up uh, appropriately, which causes uh, more heating of the additional cells. And so here you can see the transient thermal response. Uh, it looks like the, the liner and the fiberglass top plate are really doing a good job insulating the, the trigger cells from the neighbors. Now, if we look at the fourth case uh, with the middle cell thermal runaway, the trends are very uh, similar uh, as the corner cell. The one difference that uh, I believe Kylie pointed out already was that uh, the maximum cell temperatures are about 10 degrees C lower than they were for the corner cell case. So the corner cell is kind of the, the worst case scenario. Um, and this has uh, you know, even more margin for uh, prevention of thermal runaway. But the story is very similar uh, for the trigger um, cell here. Uh, you can see the current distribution is slightly different. And then once that goes into thermal runaway, then the other cells pick up the slack in terms of current. And here you can also see the, the transient uh, animation of the, uh, of the temperature response in the pack. Now, up until this point, um, let's see here. Let me see if I can advance the slide here. The, uh, looks like I might be having a computer uh, glitch here. Let's see if I can uh, let me close. Looks like PowerPoint uh, stopped working for me here. Uh, so let me uh, go back in and restart that. Apologies, folks. Let me go back through all this. Okay, so up until now, the analysis was not incorporating a, uh, the presence of a top bus bar. Uh, and we found that uh, for one of the test cases, it looked like that was actually something that, that was worthy of considering because the, um, in one of the test cases here, it looks like the ejecta from the thermal runaway event actually caused some prolonged heating of the bus, which caused um, a neighboring cell here to go into uh, thermal runaway as well. And so uh, what we did in the models, we, we included this as a final step uh, to capture the bus bar and then uh, assume that some of that uh, total heat release uh, goes into ejecta that's actually um, being um, heating up the, the bus bar. And so we didn't actually try to model this, uh, replicate this test exactly. Um, but uh, when you do that, when you include uh, ejecta, a certain percentage of ejecta uh, on the bus bar, that actually causes uh, the entire pack to go into uh, thermal runaway. And it's interesting uh, that I imagine with, uh, you know, 
the tweaking some contact resistances and some thermal properties and, and so forth, and playing with the uh, ejecta heat uh, that goes onto the bus bar, we could probably replicate the test um, in this case. But it's interesting to see just um, a proof of concept that you can actually get the entire pack to go into thermal runaway under certain circumstances. And it's also interesting looking at the current profile that as each cell starts to go into thermal runaway, each uh, neighboring cell now has to carry more and more current to pick up the slack to the point where obviously the entire pack is no longer functional. Uh, now, on top of this, uh, there's a couple things to note about the, the modeling behavior inside the software. And that includes uh, the ability to easily uh, explore the design space with um, a built-in case setup dialog inside the software. And so the model, as it stands, is easily uh, set up to trigger any of the 14 cells into thermal runaway. And so the fact that each design takes only, you know, uh, 15, a couple minutes to run, that uh, you can, you know, explore many, many cases very quickly um, to explore, you know, okay, well, what, what cell is the worst case scenario? Um, but what happens if I do a, a statistical variation of the energy release? Um, or the fractional heat that goes into certain surfaces of the pack and so forth. And that can easily be done with this uh, design space exploration tool in GT. And it's also worth mentioning too that uh, in this thermal runaway problem setup, uh, the software was using just an electrical equivalent uh, characterization of the cell. Um, but there's also an approach that could be done inside the software to predict the performance of the cell. Um, and there's some nice benefits of that uh, using this electrochemistry model in the sense that maybe if the user's not necessarily looking at thermal runaway, but looking at uh, how the cell deg degrades over time, um, that, that prediction can be done inside the tool just by easily swapping out the cell for the electrochemistry uh, version of the cell. Also, the spec sheets uh, for this given cell design don't really have a good uh, data beyond certain temperatures. And so, you know, extrapolating to, uh, you know, higher temperatures, for example, uh, you know, we really can't do that with the uh, information from the internet. But if we had uh, uh, an electrochemistry model built in, that would allow us to, to have that extrapolation with confidence. Uh, also, the, the cells can be analyzed uh, from a 3D perspective as well uh, to give even more detail uh, insights into the cell. And so with that, uh, I want to say thanks for watching and I'm happy to entertain any, any questions you might have. Uh, if you want to reach out after the fact, uh, please feel free to email me at j.harrison at gtisoft.com. And so again, thanks for watching. Uh, we've got a, a list of these references here. Happy to, to share the information after the fact. Hey, John, that was great. I really appreciate your time. Um, I've already got a couple questions that we're going to throw at you, and then uh, I'll also let the uh, chat bar continue to populate. Uh, the first question uh, had to do with your thermal runaway modeling, and, and they wanted to know, uh, does uh, your thermal runaway modeling uh, require the GT auto lithium ion 1D 3D package? So I guess maybe John, could you could you help us understand what specific GT packages are you using here? And for the 3D thermal runaway simulations, what packages would be required to do the simulations you show here? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. So we're not actually using the, uh, at least for the, the results we showed here, we're not actually using the uh, detailed electrochemistry uh, uh, module inside GT. And so uh, just the base package includes everything uh, that was shown in the workflow. So there's no separate uh, package you would have to pick up. Uh, the 3D FE, the electrical, the flow, um, all that, uh, the CAD builder, that's all incorporated into a single package. Awesome. And, and then we have a, a, a question from Alicia Liebscher, and she asks, uh, she asked if she heard correctly that the modeling only assumed that 20 to 40% of the cell energy was released. If so, was it assumed that the remainder stayed with the cell? Uh, so maybe you could provide clarification on the specific heat load that you used and how you translated uh, the, the package. I saw that you showed some of the fractional calorimetry results, so maybe you could uh, share with the audience how you, how you came up with the uh, specific heat load that you used. 
Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So we, uh, I, I think there was a reference uh, from the short course last year that um, uh, there was like a baseline for saying you know 20% of the heat goes into the uh, the jelly roll or 30% or something, and then that 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 heat that gets applied is very quickly um, between a half second and one and a half seconds. So we assume the one and a half second uh, interval to release all of that energy. Now we assumed in the baseline model without the bus bar that uh, the other 70% or so just flies into the air and doesn't get absorbed by the pack. Now maybe that's not a great assumption, but uh, that's what that's what we used in uh, in the modeling. No, that, that that's a that's a great explanation. Um, and and uh, Alicia, the the course he's talking about, you know, we we cover in depth the. Uh, topic of fractional calorimetry, and, and I won't go too far into it here. I don't want to steal John's thunder, but the idea is that when a cell explodes, not all of the energy stays right there. Um, some of it gets ejected away, and so uh, NASA has been using a technique called fractional calorimetry to help battery analysts understand, well, when you do your model, how much of that total heat stays right there in the jelly roll and how much of it flies away. Um, and, and then that information from test becomes very helpful when doing an analysis like what you see here, where you have to specify your heat. Um, so I have a question, Jonathan. Can you walk us through, uh, um, and, and you may have mentioned this about you know start to finish, um, building up you know a, a thermal model of a bank where where you've got the three D geometries uh, and, and the meshing. Uh, approximately how long for a uh, affluent user of GT Suite would it take uh, to put this model together? Well, it took me less than a day total to build the CAD and, and build the model. Um, I imagine, you know, a non-experienced user of GT, assuming they had CAD already or proficient in CAD, I, I can't see it taking them more than, uh, you know, a couple days at the most to make this model because we do have good tutorials. Um, we do have some basic explanations about how to create an FE mesh and, uh, you know, contact uh, other, you know, uh, components to another. And then once you kind of get the hang of that, then it's, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of principles you need to learn to actually build the model. So I would say conservatively, you know, at the most a, a couple days for a non-experienced user. Great. And then I'll ask one more question. Could you go to the slide where you compared your thermal runaway, I guess slide 13, where, where you have your thermal runaway results, uh, the test and the model. Um, so you, you showed earlier in the presentation, the, the general uh, layout of the bank, right? Where you've got your cells, your sleeves, your foam, and so on. Did you find it difficult to correlate your model to the test results as that correlation pertains to defining the interface resistances? The thermal path? Uh, so, yeah, basically what I did was uh, I started with, with no interface resistance, and then I just kind of said, okay, well, the temperatures are, are crazy off, and I just kept bumping everything up. So I didn't actually go in and try to fine-tune the model. I said basically all the contact resistances are uh, a thousand, uh, basically. Uh, that, that seemed to be something that matched pretty well here. But that, those are parameters of the model. And so you can easily go in, particularly, and distribute that to, to run, a, you know, a small design of experiments to really maybe even hone in on the best correlation to the test data. So I could have run the optimizer here if I if I wanted to spend a little more time to set that up. Great. Awesome. Those are my questions. I think you've answered the questions that were on the chat. So with that said, uh, John, I want to thank you for putting this presentation together. It was very informative. Um, I think it's also interesting to see uh, uh, the same model, uh, but in two different uh, software packages, just to see the different things we can do uh, depending on the on the platform that we're using, right? So, um, you know, so kind of looking what you've done here, looking at some of the some of the tools that that we've seen with Sim Center, I think it's very interesting to see this type of analysis as it's done in these different software packages. So that was great to see that with GT Suite. Uh, and now uh, we're, we're going to take a look one more time uh, with with, uh, with another software package. So we're going to look at, at what we can do uh, for battery thermal modeling when it uh, comes to thermal desktop. And so Doug Bell's here to share that with us today. 
So Doug, while you share your screen, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. Uh, so Doug or Mr. Bell has been involved in heat transfer and fluid flow since 1993. Uh, he's been using CNR thermal desktop since 2000 uh, with a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the North Carolina State University. Mr. Bell has worked for CR Tech for two, since 2006 and, 2006 and previously worked for NASA and Lockheed Martin. Mr. Bell has performed uh, thermal and fluid analysis on stratospheric airships and research balloons and their flight control electronics. Uh, the thermal protection systems uh, for the X-33 and hypersonic vehicles, launch control electronics for missile launchers, uh, missile storage containers and launch tubes, boilers, and on-orbit spacecraft. So with that, uh, Doug, I want to thank you for being here with us today, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, great. Uh, just making sure I'm unmuted, right? <laughs> yes, you're coming through loud uh, and clear. Okay, excellent. All right, yes, I uh, thank you, Will. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, now, this is going to be very similar to what was presented by Jonathan and Kylie, so I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail of the uh, uh, model buildup, uh, but more look at uh, some of the uh, assumptions that I've made and then also uh, looking at some of the features that are beneficial to uh, battery analysis within thermal desktop. So it's certainly important to take a look at the electrochemical phenomena in a lithium ion battery, uh, but then approximations of the exothermic and endothermic heating in the cells can allow you to evaluate just the thermal behavior. So you can go from a cell level to a system level to, um, or subsystem, and then to system level uh, within thermal desktop. Uh, so this, this is just explaining some of the things we looked at uh, but looking at the overall procedure, uh, creating a model of a single cell uh, is the first step. And you can go through and test that and make sure it works the way you expect it to before you put it into the overall model. Uh, very similar to uh, what Kylie and Jonathan presented, uh, this model is gonna be referenced as a TD block reference uh, that can be updated within one location. So you have one, referenced file, and then that's placed in multiple locations within the overall model, and you have unique instances in that overall model. Then we uh, create a model of the block configuration. Uh, just like before, this was created using the geometry and space claim. Uh, I didn't have anything to import, so I had to create it myself. Uh, and then you mark up the geometry with the modeling information. What are the material names? What are the submodels? Uh, what are the surface properties for radiation? Uh, and then domains are used for uh, making connections within the thermal model once you get to it. Uh, mark up the geometry for with mesh controls. Uh, this could be looking at uh, mesh size and density, maybe sweeping the mesh so it's a little more uh, you know, less resolved, easier to solve, faster to solve, and also looking at possibly um, curved elements so that you can have a coarser mesh, uh, but still capture the shape of the geometry. And then import that mesh into thermal desktop. And in the, uh, in the overall model, once you have this mesh in here, we can bring in the reference cell and copy it multiple times. So here we copied 14 times. Add any additional geometry. Uh, I added it in the sleeves after the fact. Uh, they could have been block references as well. Uh, boundary conditions, heat loads, contactors, uh, and then the user logic for the, for the heat load calculations. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. And then define the case sets uh, by setting symbols to activate and deactivate various model behaviors. So in this situation, we're running a charging scenario, a discharging scenario, a thermal runaway on a corner cell and thermal runaway on a center cell. So I have, for example, a symbol uh, called runaway cell. And for charging and discharging, I set that to zero. Well, that turns off any 
runaway heat heating. Uh, when I set it to one, cell one will be heated as a as a thermal runaway, and we'll see that heat propagate out. And so I could set this up however I need to. So just to uh, go over this a little bit more, um, yeah, thermal desktop focuses on the thermal aspects. So how the batteries affect, say, a spacecraft and how the spacecraft affects the batteries. Uh, so this information can then be fed back into the tools that can perform the electrochemical analyses. Um, now, since we're not doing the electrochemical, uh, we are assuming charging and discharging, uh, but we're also including the overpotential and the entropic heating uh, based on the average jelly roll temperature. So you're going to see some different shapes to these curves than what you've seen uh, in some of the other uh, results. So this is uh, just showing the, the behavior as it, it goes through. And of course, you can see that most of the heat focuses in the middle where it can't get out as easily to the, to the boundary conditions. Um, but then it, this does tend to see a few spikes as the uh, um, heating changes, as the state of charge changes and the overpotential uh, behave differently. So then discharging, uh, we see the, the heat rise up uh, and the temperature, or, or the heat rise up in the cells. And so this is a very, fairly simple analysis as well. And that's not, not very exciting to watch, so I'll skip forward. Uh, <laughs> Now, for runaway, uh, now you'll notice that, um, and I've, I've noticed that my temperatures are a little bit higher than some of the other uh, presentations, and that's simply going to be the difference in uh, geometries. Uh, I th think I saw one person had maybe one and a half millimeters between cells uh, in the, uh, the foam. I've got three millimeters. So you're going to see more isolation of a cell. Uh, something else I noticed was uh, when Kylie presented the runaway, the temperature scales were auto scaled for the entire solution, which can be very useful in many situations. Here, though, it tends to lose all of the detail in the lower temperatures. So what I've done is I've set a, a fixed scale uh, with a maximum of 120 degrees, and so anything that's above 120 degrees will be in that nice, beautiful pink color. Uh, so we'll see how that looks. And so this way you can see more of the gradients in the lower uh, temperature ranges. Now for the uh, thermal runaway, uh, I just assumed a two second pulse of 25,000 uh, 25, watts uh, to represent the release of the, the battery's potential. So this is a very simplified assumption for the heating. And then for cell seven, which my numbering might have been different than uh, the others, but this is uh, actually this cell. It'll be, become very obvious here. So Moving on to some of the features of interest, uh, Thermal Desktop allows for very quick updates uh, to a design. So if you go through thinking about parameterization, uh, setting up your geometry dimensions, uh, you can parameterize those to make easy updates so that it can feed through to many different areas of the, of the system. Uh, other values such as contact conductances can also be parameterized for uncertainties. So between the jelly roll and the um, can turned out to be uh, 670, but that came from a, a reference. But if you didn't have that reference, you could then perform your own tests. And we have an automatic, automatic test data correlation tool 
so you can minimize the error between the model results and the test data and it'll change automatically change identified uncertainties and that way you can match up phenomena that are not included in the solution uh, the same tool can also be used um, for model to model correlations so that you can improve your reduced resolution models for say a system level study where you don't want to have quite the resolution that you have but you want to at least understand uh, where your peak temperatures are happening and get that information back out to the designers uh, another nice feature for quick updates are material aliases so i can go through and and identify say the foam liner as foam liner and then i can say foam liner means and I can use foam glass one, or I could use, um, you know, styrofoam or replace it with any material I want so that I don't have to go through and change individual objects. I simply change the reference uh, to this material alias. So it's great when the design is not mature and things are changing rapidly, um, but also helps when you need to perform the trade study to determine uh, where that what the best material would be. Uh, TD Direct Mesh updates. So bringing the mesh from Space Claim into Thermal Desktop, all of the thermal connections that are made uh, through the domains, which are the TD markups, TD Direct markups, uh, are reapplied if the mesh is updated due to say a resolution change or any geometry modifications. So if we went through and changed the overall dimensions of the, of the block and redistributed the cells inside of that, uh, we would still know which surfaces are contacting the, the sleeves, which surfaces are contacting the, um, the lower capture plate or the up, upper capture plate. So all of that is, is reconnected when you do those updates. Now, something that was mentioned are the TD block references. Uh, now, this is a specialized external reference or XREF uh, that allows multiple instances of the same item from the same file to be placed into a model. And so when the referenced file is updated, all the copies of that reference are updated and they're all re recognized as individual objects in the analysis. Uh, so this certainly allows you to reuse uh, some part into various uh, configurations. Now you'll recognize the design on the left uh, as from this study, but the one on the right is something we posted on our website uh, a while back. User customization is a very powerful feature as well. Uh, the solution can be customized to meet the analysis needs. So like I said, thermal desktop doesn't include the electrochemical phenomena, but uh, assumptions can be added to the solutions through user customization in order to do this. Uh, in, or, in addition to writing your own logic or adding subroutines, we have a feature called user defined Fortran arrays, uh, which allow you to create your own variables for nodes, conductors, or basically any network object so that uh, you might have a, a charge level of a node or something like that that's not really uh, relevant to most thermal desktop models, but it's very important to you. Uh, initializing results. Uh, you can use one solution to initialize another solution so that you can stack your solutions up together. So perhaps you're running an orbit scenario and you reach a point where you have a maximum temperature. And at that point, maybe you want to evaluate what would happen in a thermal runaway situation. Uh, well, you could create another solution that does the orbit and then you start the uh, thermal runaway, but you have to rerun all of that early portion of the orbit. Or you can simply say, this solution will be initialized uh, from this other solution at a given time. Uh, so all of that fits together. Something else we've been working on is uh, OpenTD API. Now this allows um, 
for communication with other tools. But one thing we realized that it would be very beneficial for in this situation is quickly generating multiple versions of the same component. Uh, so instead of going through and saying, I have a TD block reference, I'm gonna place it here, 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 and here in those 14 different locations, we can program that so that it would actually um, create the jelly rolls, the canister, the heat loads, the contactor between the jelly roll and the canister, and give a unique submodel ID to those things. Um, and we've programmed in the agreed upon pattern. So even though it may change in, in size or distribution, you could very quickly uh, repopulate that. Um, so these programs can be reused. So you could create a library of complex components to very quickly add into uh, various models. And so when building a model once, TD block references work well. Um, and then you can update that TD block reference. But if that configuration is gonna change often and you need to reposition all of those objects, then certainly programming the cell creation can pay off. So I do wanna make a note here um, that the program that I'm gonna show a demonstration on uh, was created by a relatively inexperienced uh, OpenTD programmer in about five hours. Um, and the way he classified it was three months ago, he was watching C Sharp for beginners. So, um, so th this is gonna go through and, and some of it has been sped up, but some of it, and I've marked it as such, is real time. Uh, and that's when it actually populates. So um, we start with the, the model that's gonna be populated. You can see the, the brick and the sleeves without the cells inside of them. And then uh, this is just going through the uh, program. So the user created a Windows form for guided data entry. Uh, it opens a file, sets the working units, steps through the various positions uh, where it's gonna create the cells, and then generates the cells, builds up the uh, heating terms, uh, both the um, current-based and um, entropy-based heating terms. And then builds up or finds, if, it's, if they already exist, any symbols or layers uh, to access those or creates them if they're not found, uh, if those are important. So then once this has been written, all you have to do is run it, which is, this is where it is. And here's the form is filled up. And I've turned this to real-time behavior. So you can see the person is typing in uh, how many rows, how many columns, uh, how many objects in each, uh, in each of those, and the total or the distance between each of the rows and columns. And then where's the origin uh, of this pattern? So then he selects the drawing to populate. And this is going off and populating them. Unfortunately, we didn't capture the actual population, but it's now complete. And so that took about 35 seconds, including the data entry. Um, so here's the populated um, model. We've turned off a few layers to make it clear for view. And each cell is in its own submodel. And uh, each cell has its own uh, heat load applied, uh, both the entropy and the IV dissipation. So we've been focusing on electrochemical and thermo uh, cells, but let's throw in hydraulic as well. Uh, so just so we don't neglect FlowCAD uh, in our package, uh, there is a thing called a flow battery where the electrolytes are stored separate from the cell itself, and then they are pumped through, uh, uh, through the battery and through each of the cells. So this demonstration, we, we have this documented on our, uh, on our website, um, but this is a single cell in a 17 stack, and I need to move a thing here, uh, 17 cell stack in a six stack battery 
uh, over the course of a day. So this has, and you don't see it here, but it has flow going through each of these channels in a serpentine pattern. Uh, and that's the electrolyte that's flowing through. And we've um, got the, and I'm gonna butcher these terms, but the catholyte and the analyte um, are on each, each of the sides. So, and then some of the different references we have, and I, I've mentioned some of the sample models um, that I've pointed to, and you can get find those on our forum. Uh, but there's the uh, primary lithium ion battery, which is then reused for our TD block reference. And then we have the large assembly of lithium ion batteries, which has flow channels on either side. Uh, with so we have active cooling on our on our batteries, and then of course that flow battery is there as well. So with that, um, again, Will, thank you for this opportunity to to present this, and I also want to thank the the TFOS team for uh, putting this format of TFOS together. Uh, I know it hasn't been easy to switch uh, in the middle of the year when you're almost ready to send out the invitations, but um, it's, it's so far has been working out well. Uh, but I would, I will say, I, I kind of hope that this is the last time we have to do it virtually. Hey, thanks, Doug. I really appreciate your presentation. And yeah, I, I miss seeing everyone. It's kind of like the one time of the year we get to, we all see all the thermal people. We all <laughs> see each other and, and interact. And so, uh, uh, my heart's hurting a little bit this week, but uh, yeah, the conference coordinators have done an outstanding job with, at a minimum, allowing us to to, to continue on and carry the torch each year. So I'm very pleased with the way uh, the virtual format has uh, turned out. But yes, hopefully we'll see each other again soon. Um, now, I want to give you, uh, Doug, uh, we had uh, a couple things chime in on, on the chat. And so I wanted to give uh, you your first question. Uh, and I think this had to do with the initialization that you were talking about. Um, and it's when uh, using a previous solution for the initial conditions for a new analysis, is the solver reusing temperatures only, or is it also reusing fluxes and conductances? So basically do all conditions from the initial case set carry over, or is it just the temperatures? So it depends on which option you choose and depends on what's going on in the in the model so you you have a choice between initializing temperatures uh, but then you could also reference say there's different fluxes going on but uh, from environment things like that you would obviously have to reapply those uh, but there's one option that does initializing temperatures and also registers, which are some of those parameters that I mentioned. So you would also be able to pull in your state of charge, uh, things like that uh, for the batteries. Um, but those are the things that are initialized there. And that is a very simple initialization. It can be applied from, you know, a system level model down to a more detailed model as long as or, or focused model uh, as, as long as those nodes are in both uh, solutions, but you can change the configuration uh, between those initializations. Uh, we also have an option for a restart, uh, which a restart would, uh, it has to be the exact same model. So you can't remove something or add something. Uh, but then it is as though you continued that solution from that time point. So you have to, let, let's say you restarted from the middle of a solution, but you want to run to a different end time. Well, you ha now have to reset that end time because it's resetting everything. It thinks it just picked up right where it left off. So there are two options there. There's the initialization and there's the restart option. So restart's a little more, uh, restrictive, uh, but it is complete. Uh, and then initialization is temperatures and any other uh, user variables uh, 
that you want that you want to reinitialize and you can exclude things as well. Great. Thank you, Doug. Uh, one other thing uh, that came up in the chat, and I think this was in reference, you were discussing uh, how hot your cell got during the thermal runaway animation. And, and, and you, you, you took note of, you know, well, there's differences in geometry and, and potential, I believe you mentioned differences. That there, there could be difference in contact uh, interface resistance, which could impact that. Um, uh, I think Steve, Steve in the chat brought up a, another great point too, and that's that if you leave too much energy remaining within the cell, uh, that could also uh, result in your trigger cell looking too hot. Um, and so I think just adding on to some of the points you were making, Doug, one other uh, uh, variable that could impact how hot your cell gets is how much heat you apply during your thermal runaway. So if you assume, for example, like what was in Kylie's presentation, that all of that 50 kilojoules stays right there, uh, you could potentially simulate, and I, I'm throwing air quotes up, of course, nobody can see me right now. Uh, <laughs> You, you could simulate a cell getting into thousands of degrees Celsius, which may not be the case. And so it, it, it's a balance, right? It's a balance of those conductances, uh, those geometries, and also what heat load do you apply and, and how realistic is that heat? So sure, that was just kind absolutely. Of and, and then, right. Doug, and, and, and even, even, even material properties, because I think uh, I didn't look at it recently, but I think the foam glass one is probably uh, less conductive than. Uh, what John presented. So, um, you know, and it, I think I was using even temperature dependent conductivities. So all of those, you know, looking at the different results that were presented, uh, you know, there was no exact comparison that, that could be made, uh, but you have to think about all those possibilities. And, and I like that you put it that way, because I think that's a message that, that I had hoped uh, that, that the audience would hear, right? And, and that's the complexities of the thermal path, right? There's, yes. it's, not, it's not just material properties and, and heat loads, but it's, especially with batteries, well, how are, what are your material properties and how does that play together with what your conductance assumptions are? Do you assume a, a solid conductance, or I'm sorry, a specific conductance versus a temperature dependent conductance, right? Um, right. and all of that plays a role. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Now, one other thing you mentioned, you mentioned curved elements and where I wanna go with this question is uh, the geometry you showed, and this is a geometry that I think we saw in all four presentations at one point uh, or another, is this geometry of a brick with holes cut out. What is the most effective way uh, using your tools to mesh a, a brick with holes cut out. Uh, you know, it's one thing to simulate a bank, but then if we talk about this gets expanded into a system level battery, you can end up with a very high mesh count. So what, what are your thoughts on, on how to handle that specific geometry? Well, if I were going to a more system level, uh, I might even look at simplifying even further and, and putting, uh, contactors between the uh between the cells to represent the foam uh instead of actually modeling the foam you know and and you can play around with that as like i mentioned with the model to model comparison um so that you can say yeah the, these two perform the same even though i've greatly simplified uh the second one uh so you know, always looking for ways to simplify what's uh, modeled. And, you know, that doesn't get you out of, you know, running the more detailed model, uh, but, it, but it does help with those system level uh, where you're going to end up having pallets of these things. Uh, and maybe it's, you know, on a model that's meant to look at uh, somebody's experiment that it happens to be next to the batteries. So you don't want to spend all your time evaluating every single cell of the battery. Um, so th there's, there's a lot of different things that go into deciding, you know, what gets included in that model and what doesn't. Uh, and that, that's why they call us engineers, right? 
<laughs> is, is to make those make those decisions of, you know, is this important for the analysis or, you know, am I over um, over analyzing? Great. Thank you, Doug. Um, all right. That that was my question. And I, I see that we've answered the questions that are in the chat. So I think that's all. So we, we've gone through all four presentations now, and, and I'd like to just kind of give a, a, a really special thank you to uh, to Kylie and Jonathan and Kaushik, uh, to, to John, Harrison, and, and Doug, to you. Um, last year at the end of TFAS, uh, I, I, I gave my, my short course, but I also kind of had these conversations uh, with some of these guys at, at the conference about you know, this possibility of doing some type of collaborative educational session on how to do battery thermal analysis. And, and, uh, and so I really appreciate you taking the time to, to, to make this happen. Uh, I think that uh, it's been very informative. We've seen different ways of doing this type, same, similar analysis, but to, with different software packages, which is really what I was aiming for uh, in this session. And so I wanna thank uh, the, uh, uh, the vendors uh, for participating and, and for really making this possible. So, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to throw up uh, one thing on my screen, uh, and I showed this at the beginning of the presentation. But this is just uh, two questions for for anyone who who's online. Uh, I would hope that you would email me uh, and just kind of answer these two questions uh, if you have the time. Which is, you know, how did you hear about this session? Uh, and also, you know. Every year we have TFAS. We are dedicated to having uh, TFAS, even in, in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, our coordinators at Marshall were able to make this happen for us. And so I am certain TFAS will continue on in the future. And, and I would hope to continue addressing um, battery thermal related topics. And so uh, my second question to you is, is what other battery thermal related topics would you like to see covered in, in a future TFAS? And so I'm gonna leave this pulled up here um, I'm also going to stick around for another uh, 15 minutes or so until the session closed at 1130. If you have questions, feel free to chime in on the chat and I will stick around and try to answer them via audio uh, or you can email me your questions. I will try to answer them that way. Um, if you have a question for a specific uh, presenter today, uh, just shoot me an email and I will try to field that question to them. And if they're comfortable answering, then I'm sure they will. Uh, but with that said, I think we can go ahead and close the session out. Um, and, and yeah, so thank you for attending. Okay, uh, so Alex uh, threw in a question. Could you comment on battery heat generation assumptions and the relationship to temperature, uh, discharge rate, and the best modeling practices for large system models? Uh, and, and that's a really great, great, great question. Um, and, and I think the best visualization I can offer you today is if you think back to the slide that Doug showed, where it, it wasn't just a, a, a it, it was a discharge temperature profile, right? And there, there was some waiver and fluctuation to it. And that's because uh, the, the the performance and efficiency of the battery are dependent on two things. It's dependent on your state of charge and, and what temperature you're operating at. Well, I should say three things and also dependent on, on what rate you're operating the cell. Um, and I think this is why Kylie hit on during her presentation that if, you, if you're wanting to do a more detailed thorough model, you might want to consider using uh, the energy balance as prescribed by Bernardi in 1985. And what that does for us is it provides with us the relationship between current, uh, the difference in your uh, working voltage and, and your and your open circuit voltage, and then your entropic heating effects. Um, the differences in those values are largely what drive your heat generation rates when you're operating your battery. Why that's related to temperature is, well, let's think about our voltage profiles. Our voltage profiles that drive that heat generation rate um, are, are, are temperature dependent as well. So if you were to look at a data sheet for a lithium ion cell, a lot of vendors will provide, or I shouldn't say vendors, I should say OEMs, a lot of our OEMs will provide 
your voltage profile for say a 1C charge, but they'll provide that at, well, we ran the 1C charge at minus 20C at, um, my, uh, at 0C, at 20C, at 40C, and at 60C. And you're gonna see that at the different, different um, temperatures, uh, the voltage profile you get when operating your cell is different dep depending on the temperature you're operating at. Why that matters for heat generation is because the heat, the rate at which you're generating heat is a function of what that profile is. So if that profile is temperature dependent, subsequently your heat generation rate is temperature dependent. That relationship is described in the battery energy balance as provided by Bernardi. Uh, and, and that application applies for both discharge and for charge. Um, now, as for applying that to a large system model, uh, I think Kylie really hit on this in her presentation, right? And, and that was, you know, that's what th that's one of those cases where you want to have a a bulk uh, a bulk heat load placed on all the jelly rolls in, in all of your model, and then you can just add a multiplication factor to that bulk heat load, right? So do a cell level based calculation of what that uh, heat load should be, and then you can multiply it out, or uh, you could just have individual heat loads on each of the cells. It just depends on how large your system level model is. But let's say we're talking a system level model with hundreds of cells. One of my starting points might be to apply a bulk level heat load. Now, if I'm concerned about gradients developing in my system, it would be at that point that I might consider applying that same logic, but at a cell level. And I'll throw in a plug. Uh, I discussed this topic in detail in my short course on lithium ion batteries that is posted on the NESC Academy online. Looks like we have another question coming in. Uh, the, this question asks, uh, could you comment on thermal runaway for uh, packs using pouch cells? They seem to be less studied compared to 18650 cells. That's a great question. Pouch cells, those are a lot of fun. Uh, so I, I will say that the 18650 cell and, and other similar cells, such as the 21700, these are, these are widely used cells. 
um, that, that, that are, are mass produced and, and used in a number of different technologies ranging from auto, aerospace, uh, power tools, things. But um, there's, also, there's also that other format, right? The pouch cell, which, which has promised to have, have extremely uh, uh, energy dense and power dense, right? Uh, pouch cells are widely used as well in laptops and cell phones. And yet, uh, we tend to hear a little bit less about uh, the thermal runaway behavior of pouch cells, except for the fact, well, we often hear about them in the news, right? When we, um, you know, when, when a cell phone catches fire or when a laptop catches fire and it makes its way to the news, right? So we, we, we do hear about pouch cell thermal runaway, but um, when it comes to modeling, uh, I, I would say the modeling of pouch cells uh, I would argue it, it is significantly more difficult from, from, from a cell heating perspective. So uh, uh, an 18650 cell and cylindrical cells in general have designed failure paths built in, right? So what that means is the cell is designed to fail in a specific way. It's going to fail out the top vent, or maybe it's a bottom vent cell. It's going to fail out the bottom vent. And so there are cases where the cell doesn't fail that way, right? Where maybe there's a sidewall rupture or a spin group breach, something like that. And that can impact your heating behavior. But nonetheless, in general, those cells are tend to, t tend to fail the way they were designed to. Uh, pouch cells are different, right? It, it tends to be this flexible packaging. And what typically results is it can split anywhere on that seam uh, when it goes into thermal runaway. Uh, and that can be difficult when it comes to figuring out how much heat comes out of that seam. Um, so if you think of, uh, if you've seen any of the work we've done on fractional calorimetry, right, where we're aiming at not just understanding that total heat release, but also the fraction, how much comes out the sides of the cell, uh, it can be problematic uh, when, when you're trying to understand that with pouch cells because uh, you don't really know where the cell is going to fail, what part of the seam it's going to fail on. Um, and, and so I, I, that's not really an answer to why they're less studied. And, and maybe I, I, I wouldn't say, I don't know if it's that they're less studied or maybe that, that, that the results are just less prominent in, in, in academic literature. Uh, but I, I would just say that, that they're just more tricky. Uh, and I know that that's a bit of a softball answer, and I apologize for that. Um, but I, I will say uh, we have interest. Uh, one of the things we've advertised when we talk at least about our fractional calorimeter that we developed at JSC is one of our capabilities we are developing is, um, you know, ways that we can do our calorimetric technique with pouch cells. Uh, they're, they're a very unique uh, 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 energy storage device as compared to, to the 18650s, but um, I, I would say that there, there's a lot more work that could be done in the area of understanding the heat release. Um, but yeah. If you're going to model it, though, um, you would want to take into account the pressure in between the cells, right? You would want to take that into account in, in your determination of the contact resistance. Typically, if, you, if you've if you got a stack of pouch cells, there's going to be a pretty high pressure uh, that's applied in, in that stack up. Um, and that's, that's there for a number of reasons. And so you would want to keep that in mind when you are simulating your, your interface resistance between the cells or interface resistance between anything that is in between the cells. Uh, you, you might also want to consider using an electrochemical approximation uh, for total heat release, um, potentially as a function of the electrochemical energy stored in the cell. Um, while I don't think this is the best approach, I, I, I prefer to go to calorimetric means if possible. If you don't have calorimetric means available to you, then, then the next best step would be to approximate that total energy release as a function of the stored electrochemical energy in the cell. Uh, and then from there, uh, you could start making approximations on, you know, you, you know intuitively that a, a chunk of that energy is going to be ejected away. And so you could do a parametric or potentially Monte Carlo style parametric where you evaluate, um, well, how much, you know, for your given battery pack, how much of that heat has to be ejected away for you to meet your success criteria. Um, or you could look at it from the other way around, uh, but that would be my approach, in with lack of test data to back it up. Hope that answers your question.
Okay, let's see. We have a question from Andrew. He says, could you comment on my earlier question? Uh, oh, sorry, Andrew, I didn't mean to miss your earlier question. Uh, during the first presentation, did you calculate the contact resistance between the battery casing and the foam liner? Uh, and if so, uh, what was uh, your approach? Um, if I remember correctly, uh, we varied the con and Kylie chime in uh, if you wanna if you want, but I believe we varied the contact resistances, uh, trying to achieve a similar profile on our neighbor cells as what we saw um, in in the Orion test data that was presented in the Haynes et al presentation. So it wasn't an all out uh, direct model thermal model correlation activity, uh, but we simply just varied the conductances based on um, uh, uh, trying to ach achieve good agreement with the uh, results. Is that correct, Kylie? Yeah, that's correct, Will. Uh, to, to, I'll, I'll say, Andrew, determination of contact resistance can, can be a, a tricky thing. Um, you know, when 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 you if you look at uh one of, for for us in the thermal community, right? One the bread and butter for us is the satellite thermal control handbook, and sometimes there are some very helpful uh, correlations there, talking about different types of interfaces, uh, different types of materials under various level varying levels of, of uh, interface pressure, and what what your expected um, uh, thermal conductance across that interface would be, or what your contact resistance across that interface would be. Um, and so sometimes we, we can refer to references like that. Um, often we have to rely on uh, attempts to correlate our test data to our, uh, to our model, or I should say our model to our test data. And then we kind of go through that process of uh, does the resistance value we're using uh, pass the looks right test? Uh, sometimes we can determine the interface resistance, uh, you know, if, if you've got a, an interstitial material. Uh, so for example, sometimes with batteries, um, there is a gap pad between the battery and whatever it's mounted to. And so you could uh, do a thermal resistance calculation based on the thickness of the gap pad and the thermal conductivity of the gap pad. So there are a number of ways that we, we come up with that. Uh, but for the sake of Kylie's presentation, it was a function of, uh, of uh, comparing to test data. Now, with that said, I think we're right at 11.30, so I think this will be a good time to close the session on time, and I believe a break uh, is coming up. And so uh, with that said, you're welcome to email me any further questions, and I can either answer them myself or parse them out to the session presenters. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And with that, uh, I think Alex will close out the session.